Hi everybody and welcome or welcome back to an invisible and invisible illness awareness project. A few weeks ago I talked about what a mast cell disorder is and I mentioned that if you look into the different types of white blood cells you typically won't find mast cells listed but this week I want to focus on a type of white blood cell that actually is on that list which is eosinophils. Eosinophils are named for eosin, which is the red dye that you use to stain them. Their purpose is to attack parasites and infections, and they also play a role in allergies and asthma, just like monocytes and babophils. In a normal person, eosinophils are going to make up about 1-3% to of your white blood cell count. If you have above 5%, that means that you have eosinophilia. And if you have above 15%, then you have hyper eosinophilia. Instead of percentages, you'll also see it measured in cubic microliters, which is mm and then that superscript 3. So where 5% would be elevated, you could also say 500 mm3. Instead of 15%, it would be 1500. Elevated blood eosinophil levels are easy enough to test for because they're part of a standard blood workup. Like, the first time I went to the doctor and said, I'm really tired all the time, I have no idea what's going on, and they did that first run of tests um, for, for like iron and sugar and everything, that was on there too. Which is of course interesting because the disorder wasn't diagnosed two years later, but now I have evidence that it was already present at the time. If you have hyper eosinophilia, for more than six months. They've also infiltrated your heart, bone marrow, or nervous system. Then you have what's called hyper eosinophilic syndrome, or HES. But then aside from the blood eosinophil disorders, there are a whole host of other eosinophilic disorders that affect different organs. Normally you can find eosinophils in your medulla, in your brain, in your lower GI tract, ovary, uterus, spleen, and lymph nodes. Um, but then there are other parts of the body where they're not supposed to be at all. If you have them in your bladder, then you have what's called eosinophilic cystitis. If they're in your connective tissue, then you have eosinophilic fasciitis. If they're in your lungs, then you have eosinophilic pneumonia. There's eosinophilic asthma, which is basically the same thing as allergic asthma. And then there are eosinophilic gastrointestinal disorders. Basically your GI tract goes from your mouth all the way down through to the other end. So then they subdivide these disorders into what part of the GI tract is being affected. If they're in your esophagus, then you have eosinophilic esophagitis, or EOE, the O is written small, or sometimes it's called EE. If it's in your stomach, you have eosinophilic gastritis, or EG. If it's in your stomach and your small intestine, then you have eosinophilic gastroenteritis, or EGE. And if it's in your large intestine, then you have eosinophilic colitis, which is EC. There are other disorders like eosinophilic granulomatosis, which is an autoimmune eosinophilic disorder. But the eosinophilic gastrointestinal disorders, which are also called EGID, AGIDS for short, um, those are not autoimmune, those are just immune mediated, which actually is also just a synonym for allergic, but what it means is that, which means your organs could become collateral damage to these eosinophil attacks, but they're not actually the intended target. What's happening is your body's eosinophils are responding to external triggers like foods or something in your environment. The top five dietary triggers are wheat, dairy, eggs, seafood, and legumes. There's no officially approved treatment, but the standard protocol is that you'll be given antiacids or topical steroids. And the steroids come in the form of just a normal inhaler like you'd use for asthma. Basically, you, you open your mouth without breathing in, spray it into your mouth, and then and then swallow in order to get it to go down on the, the food pipe instead of the, the wind pipe. And then there's also a slurry, which is this paste that you have to mix up and eat every day. If you don't go the medication route or it's not enough, 
then your alternative is what's called an elimination diet where you eliminate all of your dietary triggers. The first place you're going to want to start is of course with those top five because those are the most likely triggers. Those also happen to be foods that generally would create increased inflammation for anybody, but if you're a healthy person, you're not going to notice it because it's so subtle. It is possible to then eventually get to the point where you've eliminated everything and you have no safe foods left, and then you survive off of an elemental formula, which is a hypoallergenic amino acid drink. Basically, foods contain protein, and allergic reactions are a response to those proteins. Proteins are made up of amino acids, so because this formula is already broken down or pre-digested, it's supposed to make it more difficult to react to. But then, of course, there are people who are on the formula for a long time and end up developing intolerances to that too. So now, focusing specifically on eosinophilic esophagitis, because that is the one that I have and know the most about, um, typical symptoms are going to be reflux, which is when the acid from your food comes back up, which can then damage your esophagus. Trouble swallowing because your esophagus is inflamed, which means that the space for the food to pass through is also narrowed. Food infections, which is when the food gets stuck or lodged in your esophagus. Nausea, vomiting, abdominal or chest pain. What I experienced feels like what I would imagine heartburn feels like, but that was just coincidentally where my esophagus was damaged from the infection. A lot of times you'll have like children or babies who don't really understand refusing to eat um, because of course eating will cause them pain and they don't really know why, um, or even as an adult where you know you have to eat, you just don't really have much appetite because your diet is so limited that you just, you just lose interest in the few foods that you still have left because you're stuck eating the exact same thing every single day. Um, and then you can also have difficulty sleeping because of all these symptoms like chest, abdominal pain, reflux, and nausea. Uh, one thing that a lot of people will actually will do is sleeping sort of like slanted, kind of propped up in a way so that that uh, kind of stops the reflux from coming back up. Yeah, I can definitely remember a few nights where I woke up just with this horrible pain in my chest because I had had a glass of milk or a sip of wine or something when my esophagus was already damaged. And then the other thing you get with children is what's called failure to thrive, which means that because they're so malnourished, um, they are very small. They're very short and very much underweight for their age. They look years younger than they should be. And they're just not growing because of malabsorption and having such a limited diet. Um, even though it's more common than mast cell disorders, it is still classified as a rare disease, but it's definitely becoming much more prevalent. It's actually more common in males, but typically if you're in a support group, you'll see it overwhelmingly dominated by either women who are affected themselves or mothers whose children have it. Honestly, you could chalk it up to women being more talkative, or maybe women just have it more severe. But a lot of the support groups are definitely dominated by parents whose children have it. There are a lot of children affected. With all of the other diagnoses I have, it's overwhelmingly adults, more so like middle-aged women, where I'm actually on the younger end of the spectrum and it's pretty rare that you hear about children being affected. But with the eosinophilic disorders, it seems to overwhelmingly be children. EOE is diagnosed via endoscopy, where you could see rings in the esophagus or other types of damage. But even if the esophagus looks normal, it's really important to take biopsies because there could still be eosinophils there. In my case, that turned out to be a good thing because I was able to have the biopsies reanalyzed later and stain for mast cells, which is something that they're not automatically going to be looking for. Good sources of information on eosinophilic disorders are Cincinnati Children's, which is one of the hospitals that specializes in AGITS, APFED, which is the American Partnership for Eosinophilic Disorders, and CURED, um, which is the campaign urging research for eosinophilic diseases. It was founded by a woman whose daughter has EOE and she's very motivated, working year-round, trying to raise awareness, 
and recruit people who can plan fundraisers in their city to raise money, to get donations, to give to research for a cure. They'll often say that 100% of the donations go to research, which in itself doesn't really mean much because you don't know how much they're raising. But as far as I know, Cured actually brings in just as much as AppFed, but they donate a lot more because they're donating everything. The only one of those three that I'm aware of that has a a support group presence on Facebook is Cured. Uh, there are quite a few different groups focused on EOE or AGIDS or eosinophilic disorders, however you want to divide it up, but the Cured group is actually among the biggest. So yeah, that's it for this week, and I will see you guys next week. Bye!